from New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men, and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast, present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Tonight's story, The Adventure of the Empty House. Well, here we are, as usual, in Dr. Watson's hospitable study, all ready and waiting for our weekly treat. What's it to be tonight, Dr. Watson? Well, tonight, I think I'll tell you how Holmes made an unexpected, and I may say, dramatic return after many years' absence. Yes, it was so dramatic, I came dashed close to fainting. Well, well. But uh, before we go into that, suppose you tell us about a happy surprise that's in store for the chaps who buy their first clipper crop clothes. Surprise that won't shock their pocketbooks. How right you are, Dr. Watson. New spring clipper craft clothes are arriving constantly at fine stores everywhere. That's an important announcement for men who have always worn clipper craft and for those who will wear them for the first time this spring because clipper craft values are even more sensational today than ever before. And that's saying plenty. The clipper craft plan concentrates the buying power of 1036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast, making possible steady year-round operation, resulting in tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs, and putting those savings, even in the face of today's high prices, where they belong, in your pocket. And don't forget that your Clipper Craft dealer is a friendly local independent store, a store you can trust. Handsome new Clipper Craft suits are only $40 and $45. Top coats in fine coverts and worsted gabardine are only $40 and $45. Sport jackets but $26.50. And superb tropicals but $33.75 to $40. Compare Clipper Craft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, to get back to Mr. Holmes' dramatic reappearance. Right. You know, I've always said it's a good thing to absent yourself from time to time. Makes people appreciate you when you come back. That's what Holmes said the time he was missing for three years. Three years? Whew, that's a pretty long lapse of time. Yes, it was, rather. Everyone thought he was dead. What a horrible time that was. I couldn't bear to live in our old lodgings in Baker Street. Associations and everything. Yes. Now, it's funny how sentimental we all are underneath. I'd taken up my quarters in a more fashionable part of town and resumed my medical practice. It was after Holmes had succeeded in driving Professor Moriarty out of England. We all believed uh, Holmes had sacrificed his life to rid society of that evil spirit. That sounds terrifically exciting, Doctor. Won't you tell us how Holmes managed to put a finish to Moriarty? What? Kill off Professor Moriarty before I've told you the rest of our adventures with him? Well, <laughs> I should say not. Never catch me throwing away good material, but, oh, but let's get down to cases. Fair enough. Very well. It was in the spring of the year 1894 when all of London, the fashionable world in particular, was dismayed by the death under most unusual circumstances of the Honorable Ronald Adair. That likable young gentleman was the second son of the Earl of Maynooth. He lived, together with his mother, the Countess of Maynooth, and his sister Hilda, at 427 Park Lane. The youth moved in the best society, but was very fond of cards, played continually. Aha, uh -huh. piling up gambling debts he couldn't pay. Well, as a matter of fact, it came out in evidence that he had actually won as much as 420 pounds in one sitting at his club the week previous. From Godfrey Miller and Lord Balmoral, I believe it was. His partner was a certain Colonel Moran. But then he must have been well ahead of the game. Oh, quite. And yet it was to this easygoing, likable, I might even say lucky young aristocrat, that death came in a most strange and unexpected form on the night of the March the 30th. He returned from his club shortly after ten, his mother and sister having gone to the opera. The butler, Peter, swore that he heard him enter the front room on the second floor, generally used as his sitting room, the night being chilly, he had lit a fire, and as it showed a tendency to smoke, one of the front windows had been opened about four inches. Nothing further was heard from this sitting room until 11.30, the hour of the return of Lady Maynooth and her daughter. Peters testified that her ladyship seemed rather agitated. Oh, 
gracious, Hilda. I declare I'm chilled to the bone. Oh, sorry, Mama. Oh, Peters, will you help me with my carriage boots? Certainly, my lady. You've returned so early. I trust the opera was not a disappointment. Oh, no, indeed, Peters. It was heavenly. Only Mama can never bear to stay for the death scenes at the end. So depressing, I always think. Why, Mama, I've always thought Carmen was terribly gay. Just because he knifes her in the last scene doesn't No, mean... I know. But so primitive, so brutal. And that bit in the gypsy camp where Carmen keeps turning up the ace of spades, the card of death. I, well, I had the queerest foreboding during that scene, as though Ronnie needed me. Oh, dear, I do wish he wouldn't play whist so often. I'm sure it's not good for him. A boy his age should have other interests. I wish I could get that ace of spades out of my mind. I can't help feeling it means something. Oh, nonsense, Mama. You've just given yourself another case of the fidgets. The English climate that's depressing you, that's all. One day of sunshine and you'll be as gay as a lark. I'm sure I hope so. Oh, dear, listen to that wind. Fog and rain, rain and fog. Peters, uh, has Mr. Ronald come in yet? Yes, my lady, over an hour ago. He's upstairs in his sitting room. Well, thank heaven for that. I think I'll just go up and say good night to him. That's right, Mama. Make sure he isn't sitting in a draft. Hilda, really? I declare I don't know what children are coming to nowadays. No respect for their parents. Good night, darling. And you're not to sit up till all hours, mind. No, Mama. Really, I don't know how young girls nowadays expect to keep their looks if they never go to bed. Oh, dear, that wind. It's so eerie. Ronnie. Ronnie, dear, it's Mother. Why, it's locked. The door's locked. Ronnie. Are you all right? Ronnie! Mother, what's the matter? Ronnie, he's locked himself in. He doesn't answer. Peters, Hilda. Oh, come quickly, I, I'm afraid. Coming, Mother. Oh, Ronnie, Ronnie, why don't you answer? No, don't worry, my lady. It's all right, Mother, he's probably fallen asleep. Ronnie! Oh, Hilda, I'm frightened. Peters, Peters, can't you break the door down? I can try, my lady. Here, let me help. Now then, both together. <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> there. there he is, lady. Fallen asleep at the desk. But he looked so strange. Cards scattered everywhere, and look there. The ace of spades. There's blood on it. Blood dripping onto the carpet. Ronnie! Oh. Oh, Peter's quick, help me, she's fainted. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Here, put her on the couch. Uh, no, poor Lady uh, Manus. Oh, dear, mother. Shall I call the doctor, miss? Oh, never mind, Mother. It's Ronnie we have to worry about. Maybe it's not too late. Oh, Ronnie. Oh, his head. How horrible. Shot with a soft bullet. <laughs> Better not look, miss. It's not nice. Oh, Ronnie, darling, why did you do it? He didn't, miss. <laughs> oh, but, Peters, he must have the door was locked on the inside. It's not suicide, Miss Hilda. It's murder. Mr. Ronnie couldn't have done it. There's no weapon anywhere in the room. But look here, Dr. Watson. Ronald Adair was in the second-story sitting room with the door locked on the inside. Exactly, Mr. Harris. Furthermore, he was in the room alone. Yes, but if someone else shot him, how is that possible? That's what puzzled the authorities. No one could have climbed up to the open window without leaving traces of some sort. The outside wall was perfectly smooth, no ivy, no water pipes. Furthermore, there was a drop of over 20 feet from the window to the ground. Well, then the murderer couldn't have been in the room with young Adair. He must have shot at him from the street below. Remember, the window was open only four inches and the glass was not shattered. Mm, that would be a pretty remarkable shot, Doctor. Furthermore, Park Lane is not an unfrequented thoroughfare, and there is a cab stand within 50 yards of the house, and yet no one heard a shot. <laughs> nice little problem. Yes, exactly. Scotland Yard was at its wit's end. Our old friend, Inspector Lestrade, even went so far as to consult me in the matter, knowing how familiar I was with Holmes' methods of deduction. And so I promised to have a look at the facade of Lady Maynooth's house in Park Lane to see if anything uh, uh, suggested itself to me. And did it? Now, Mr. Harris, you're anticipating again. I'm sorry. Well, so it was. But around six o'clock that evening, I found myself at the Oxford Street end of Park Lane. 
a heterogeneous collection of loafers on the pavement, all staring up at a particular window, directed me to the house I had come to see. Constable. Good evening, Dr. Watson, sir. I was told you might be dropping around for a look at the scene of crime. Yes, nice little crowd you've collected here. Yes, sir. Nothing like a good murder to bring them out of their house. <laughs> and look at that old codger up there with the white whiskers. Pushing his way up to the front. <laughs> but he ain't been out of doors for months. Looks fair dusty, he does. Who oh, him, the uh, bibliophile. <laughs> the what, sir? Bibli... Book lover. Oh. Notice the titles of the volumes under his arm. I say, let's have a look. Origin of tree worship, sign language of the druids, life in early Crete. <laughs> Evidently collects obscure volumes, either as a trade or a hobby. Well, well, I never would have noticed. I'll hand it to you, Dr. Watson. You're almost as good with your deductions as Mr. Sherlock Holmes himself. Elementary, my dear constable, elementary. <coughs> mm -hmm, poor old fellow. He's got a bad cough. Lung condition, probably. Well, there doesn't seem to be anything much to discover. No possible way of scaling the front of the building from below. How about the roof? Could he have uh, come across from another building? No, sir. Inspector Lestrade looking at that first thing. Roof's all divided off with iron bars. Spikes on them. Mm. About as easy to break into as the Bank of England. Uh, well, may as well be getting on home. Yes, I dare say even Holmes couldn't solve this. Here, here's... Look where you're going, you clumsy fool. Oh, I say, I, I'm, I'm terribly sorry... I, uh, I hope you're not hurt. Who cares about me? It's my books that matter. Struck them right out of my hand. There they are, lying all over the road. Mud on their covers. Oh, please, let me pick them up. No, please. you don't. And don't you touch them. You've done enough damage already. Mercy on us. Such a mess. Nobody appreciates good books nowadays. Well, at least let me apologize. I, I'm oh, really go not away, Donna. Don't bother me. Can't you see I'm busy? <laughs> go home, can't you? You're sure no you standing around here. Well, maybe he's right. Uh, good night, Constable. Good night, Doctor. The straw knows where to find me in case he wants me. Any calls while I was out, Rosie? No, sir. Oh, good. Maybe my luck is in tonight. It was about time I had a peaceful evening at home. Oh, I spoke too soon. See what it is this time, Rosie. Croup or measles? Yes, sir, right away. No more privacy than a Siamese twin. Dr. Codd call his soul his own. And as for ever get... Oh, yes, Rosie, who is it? And what does he think he has? He died a patient, sir. No? What then? I don't rightly know, sir. He's an old fellow with white whiskers, like a billy goat. Said to tell you it was your bibliophile calling. My what? Who oh, the bibliophile? You're uh, surprised to see me so soon, eh? Well, how do you do? Come in, come in. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, that's all, Rosie. Oh, yes, sir. Well, please sit down. I hope you're recovered from the bump I gave you. <sighs> well, that's what I came to see you about, Dr. Watson. I... Oh, yes? I've got a conscience, sir. And when I chanced to see you come into this house, I... I came hobbling after you because I said to myself, I'll just step in and see that kind gentleman and tell him I'm sorry I was a bit gruff a while back and, and, and no harm meant. And uh, I'm much obliged for offering to pick up my books. Oh, not at all. Uh, maybe you uh, collect books yourself? Well, no, I, uh, I can't say that I do. N I... Never too late to learn. Now, here's a copy of British Birds and... Um, Here's a very fine catullus. Yes, but... Or, I... or perhaps this, this holy war would be more in your life. Well, really, really you know, I don't a think... A bargain, I... every one of them. With five volumes, you could just fill that gap on the second shelf. So untidy, my dear Watson, quite unlike your old self. Huh? Holmes! Obviously. I wondered how long it would take you to penetrate my disguise. Listen, you're, 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 not, you're, not, you're, not, you're not dead. Your reasoning, my dear Watson, as usual, is faultless. Well, well I, I'm... For, 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 for heaven's sake, I, Easy, Watson. I, easy, easy, easy. My, 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 my dear Holmes, I, uh, I, uh, I, I think I sit down. Uh, it's a very good idea. I'd better have a nip of this brandy. Yes, I, 
I could do with a brace, sir. I, <laughs> and I... My dear Watson, a thousand apologies. I, I had no idea you'd be so affected. Well, I, I'm not made of chill steel like you, Holmes. I, well, 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 where's my bandage? Yeah, here you are. Uh, yeah, that's better. <laughs> so it, it's really you standing here in my study. Well, uh, thank heaven why you, 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 you old reprobate. You, uh, how in heaven's name did you ever come back alive out of that dreadful chasm where, where Professor Moriarty met his death? I, it's quite simple. Uh, I was never there. Yes, but, but good heavens, Holmes, it's been three years. You... You, you, you let us believe you were dead all that time. Now, now, was that nice, I ask not, you? Not nice, Watson, but necessary. You see, Moriarty's gang was still to be dealt with. I was much safer if they believed I'd met my death at the same time as their uh, illustrious leader. For three years, I've been living in disguise, cracking the members of that foul brotherhood to the ends of the earth. And now I'm happy to say there's only one left to be dealt with. But uh, look, look here, Holmes, why didn't you... Why didn't you let me know who you were when I... But I bumped into him in Park Lane just now. Because, my dear Watson, you were being watched by the man I'm after. The last of Moriarty's gang. Good heavens, who is he? Someone you doubtless know, Watson. You may have even played whist with him on numerous occasions. And lost. Most people lose when they play with the tiger, as Moriarty used to call him. A clever man, Watson. Very clever. He not only suspects that I'm alive, he even guesses I've returned to London. Good Lord. Yes, but I mean to take advantage of this cleverness. I've set a trap for him. I expect to catch my tiger tonight. Tonight? Exactly. I, um, don't suppose you'd care to come along? You, you, you just try to prevent me, that's all I have to say. Just uh, wait uh, till I get my hat and stick. I, I think you'll find your old army revolver a little more appropriate, Watson. <laughs> And now, while Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson start tracking one of London's master criminals, suppose we tell you how to track down one of the most satisfactory bargains in the clothing business. Clippercraft concentrates on delivering exactly what you want in your clothes at remarkably low prices for such fine quality. You want long wear? Well, examine the rich, staunchly woven Clippercraft fabrics. You want comfort? You get it in Clippercraft through the most skillful designing experience can bring you. And you want the smartness your friends will admire? Clippercraft brings you all three. Smart styling, long wear, solid comfort at unbelievably modest prices. It's the result of the unique Clippercraft plan, concentrating the buying power of 1036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast and bringing you amazingly fine suits at only 40 and 45 dollars. Top coats in fine coverts and worsted gabardine for only 40 and 45 dollars. Sport jackets for only twenty-six fifty, and smart tropicals at only thirty-three seventy-five to forty dollars. Yes, selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suits, top coats, and sport jackets and tropicals. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. back to Holmes and Watson. We find them slinking down a dark and sinister little alleyway. Uh, I say, Holmes, do we have to do all this uh, pussyfooting down dark mews and through smelly stables? Absolutely, my dear Watson. It's essential that we should not be followed at this stage of the game. Yes, we've passed Manchester Street and Blandford Street. Here, down this narrow passage. Good Lord. It's as dark as the black hole of Calcutta. Here, scale this fence. Scale the fence? Now, don't tell me you've let yourself get out of condition during my absence. Certainly not, only, uh, do you think it's quite dignified? Probably not, but who will ever know? Up with you. All right. A little better. Uh, here we are. Uh, uh, 
I've ruined the knees of my trousers. Oh, stop burbling, Watson, and come along. We've got to get into this house. Yes, but look here. It's, uh, it's an empty house. Quite. That's why I selected it. Now, where did I put that key? Oh, don't tell me you're not going to pick the lock. Holmes, <laughs> you're losing your grip. Quiet. Come in. Easy does it. Shut the door after you. Gently, my dear Watson. Gently! Well, I'm doing my best. It was a draft. Well, now what? Come along upstairs. We should get a good view from the windows of the upper front room. You know, Holmes, there's something spooky about an empty house. Strange noises, boards squeaking. Easy. We turn a corner here. Are you with me? Oh, absolutely. Ah, this is the room. Excellent. The light from the street lamp all the illumination we shall need. Look here, Holmes. There's something familiar about this street out there. It's, why, of course, it's, it's Baker Street. Exactly. We're in Camden House, which stands opposite our old quarters. I <laughs> sure, no wonder it looked familiar. But why station ourselves here? Because it commands an excellent view of our historic dwelling. Uh, might I trouble you, my dear Watson, to draw a little nearer to the window, taking every precaution not to show yourself. Right. And then look up at our old rooms. We'll see if three years of absence have entirely taken away my power to surprise you. Well, the, the windows of our sitting room are lighted. I, I see there's a man sitting in front of one. Well, look here, it's you, it. Well, that, that is, at least it's your silhouette. It's a bus stop, me to be exact. Anything else of interest in Baker Street? Uh, let's see. Uh, there's two disreputable-looking fellows leaning against a lamppost. Excellent, Watson. I expected them. Holmes, good heavens, your head. I, I mean the dummy. It moved. Of course, our old friend Mrs. Hudson has orders to move it from below from time to time. Listen, what was that? Sounded like a door closing. Yes. I felt a draft. By all that's holy, he's going to operate from inside this building. I expected he'd work from the street as he did before. Quick, Watson, we've got to get out of here. You'll probably want this window. You, you mean whoever we're after, he's coming in here? Of course. Quick, Watson, enter the next room. Here. Stand in the shadow where we can watch him without being seen. I hear footsteps. He's coming. Quiet if you value your life. Standing in the doorway. His face is in the shadow of his hat. Great Scott, his eyes blaze in the dark like a cat's. Like a tiger's, Watson. He's crossing to the window. He's raising the window. Not very far, Watson. That won't be necessary. His stick. His walking stick. Why is he pointing it out of the window? It's a gun, Watson. Devilish invention. Doesn't make a sound. He's going to take a shot at my silhouette. When we hear the window across the street crash, we know he's fired. He's aiming. Get him, Watson, get him! Hey, here! I've got it! Don't move, you want! The gun, Watson! You thought you had me! Well, not before I squeeze the life out of you! Oh, no, you don't! Watson. Watson, are you all right? I knocked him out. Absolutely. What's that for? Those two men from Scotland Yard, down in the street, leaning against the lamppost. I must say, I thought our friend here would do his dirty work outside so they could deal with him firsthand. Ah, here come the regulars. Well, well, if it isn't Lestrade. You bet it is. I took the job myself. And maybe we weren't glad to get your message at Scotland Yard half an hour ago. Although, I must say, we've done pretty well down there in your absence. Really? Solved the Ronald Adair mystery yet? Oh, well, that is... Uh, oh, uh, uh, our sleeping beauty seems to be coming, too. Uh, Gentlemen, allow me to present Colonel Sebastian Moran, late of Her Majesty's Indian Army. Uh, I believe I'm correct, Colonel, in saying that your bag of tigers still remains unrivaled. You go to blazes. Yes, a remarkable shot. You and your air gun were invaluable to the late Professor Moriarty, eh? I might have known that wasn't you in the window. Oh, quite. I'm surprised that such a simple stratagem could deceive so old a shikar. Well, what do you mean by that? How often, Colonel, have you tethered a goat to a tree, lain above it with your rifle, and waited for the bait to attract your tiger? 
This empty house is my tree. You are my tiger. The only difference being that I did not care to be the goat myself. Take him away, Lestrade. Just a moment. You can't arrest me for taking a shot at a dummy, not even if it's the dummy of Sherlock Holmes. That's quite right. I arrest you for the murder of the Honorable Ronald Adair because you are the only man alive capable of shooting a man through the slightly open window from the street below without being heard. A truly remarkable shot, Colonel. A bit too remarkable. That's how I knew you were the murderer. Ah, and I'll come along, you. Frank, bring that stick along. Right, sir. We'll need it as evidence. <sighs> well, Watson, what do you say? Shall we step across the street to our old quarters? Right, sir. I think you'll find everything just as it used to be. And I'm sure Mrs. Hudson is anxiously awaiting us with sandwiches and a steaming pot of coffee. Ah. You see, I remember your weakness. My weakness? I like that. And that, Mr. Harris, is the story of how I went to... Lived in Baker Street again and started another series of incredible and amazing adventures, which I shall tell you about, if it won't bore you. Well, what do you think, Dr. Watson? You know, there's just one thing I don't understand about tonight's story, though. Uh, Why did Colonel Moran kill Ronald Adair? Because Adair had discovered Moran was cheating at cards and threatened to expose him. You remember that I said Adair had won 400 pounds at whist the week before with Moran as his partner? Yes. That made, uh, that amount made Adair suspicious. He discovered the cards were marked. The very cards, by the way, which were found beside the dead body. He was exam examining them again to be sure he'd made no mistake. That's why the door was locked on the inside. He didn't want anyone to interrupt him. I see. Well, what about next week's story, Dr. Watson? Uh, let me think. Next week, uh, suppose I tell you about a rather curious dinner that Holmes and I attended in order to see if we could discover if a world-famous violinist was trying to poison his wife. Uh, did you succeed? In a way, yes. Of course, there was a death. And... <laughs> but I'll tell you all about it next week. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next Sunday to Sherlock Holmes in The Case of the Very Best Butter. This is Harris speaking for Clipper Craft Clothes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Following station identification, you'll hear Melvin Elliott with a 15-minute summary of the latest news. <laughs>